Welcome to this episode of NLN Podcast Nursing Edge Unscripted, the scholarship track. I'm your host, Dr. Stephen Palazzo, a member of the NLN Editorial Board for Nursing Education Perspectives. Nursing Edge Unscripted and our track entitled Scholarship celebrates the published work of select nurse educators from the NLN's official journal, Nursing Education Perspectives, and the NLN Nursing Edge blog. The conversations embrace the author's unique perspectives on teaching learning innovations and the implications for nursing program development and enhancement. We will discuss the author's article, Facilitators and Inhibitors of LPN to RN Student Transition, a cross-sectional national survey. This discussion will focus on the unique findings of the author. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Amanda Corning, who is an assistant professor in the Lillian R. Goodman Department of Nursing Worcester State University, Worcester, Massachusetts. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're happy to have you here and we're excited to discuss your article. If you could, would you please summarize the purpose of your study and the choice of using Melissa's theory of transition as a framework for your study? Absolutely. So to start off, my co-authors and I really wanted to study LPN to RN students because LPNs tend to be a little more racially and ethnically diverse than our RN population. And so if we can really focus on bringing more LPNs in to become RNs, we have an opportunity to increase diversity in, in our profession, which is really obviously in line with national calls. And we were also interested in this specific population because we recognize that they can be educated much more quickly in times of nursing shortage. Sometimes um, a LPN can skip an entire year of an ADN nursing program and become an RN in as little as a year. So when we have opportunities for or need for increased numbers of RNs, this is an amazing uh, population to focus on. So the purpose of the study was to describe transition conditions um, experienced by licensed practical nurses or LPNs who are in registered nurse or RN educational programs. And transition conditions are those things that help or hinder someone in their in whatever transition they're experiencing. And in this case, it would be facilitators and inhibitors of the transition from LPN to a student RN. We chose to look at Melise as our uh, guiding framework um, because there were a lot of nice uh, parallels between uh, the LPN to RN student experience and Melissa's transition theory. We really wanted to know what LPN to RN students helped, felt helped them or hindered them. And so when, when we looked at Melise, we saw the, the, a central part of this transition theory is the transition conditions. And those are the facilitators and inhibitors. So it really aligned well with our, our question and area of interest. It also is widely used in nursing research, including educational research. So it really has um, you know, been through a lot of evaluation and, and proven useful in many other applications. We also ultimately would like to see programs developed to support LPN to RN students that are evidence-based. And we liked that Melise really showed a link between those facilitators and inhibitors and knowing how to intervene with the population of interest, which in this case would be LPN to RN students. So we look at this as a, as a foundation for hopefully developing evidence-based interventions to help support LPN to RN students. And Melissa's theory really, really aligned with that goal as well. Great, well, thank you for clarifying that for us. So your study found generally positive attitudes from LPNs about transitioning to the RN role but there were concerns regarding faculty support and transition stressors entering an RN program midway through. Please elaborate on these findings and what current LPN to RN programs can do tomorrow to facilitate transition for LPN students. So I'll start with faculty support. What we really looked at in part of our study was how frequently did LPN to RN students report experiencing specific facilitators or specific inhibitors. When we looked at facilitators, the things that helped our students, three out of the four least commonly reported facilitators were faculty-centered. 
-hmm. So these were facilitators that were potentially helpful for our students, but our students weren't finding they were part of their experience as often as other facilitators. So these least commonly reported facilitators were emotional support from faculty, faculty recognizing prior LPN experience, and academic support from faculty. What our study really added to the knowledge on this topic was that all of these had been reported in the literature previously, but this was the first study to our knowledge that really showed that these were particularly uncommon or relatively uncommon in our students' experience. So what can we do to help make those more commonly experienced by LPN to RN students? I think the first thing is awareness. Knowing that these are less commonly reported than other facilitators helps us target our interventions toward those three areas, academic support, emotional support, and recognizing prior LPN experience. Certainly, one way we could intervene would be education to train faculty to provide effective emotional and academic support. Something like a coaching program to provide those opportunities for interactions for that support to take place. If we never have the interaction between faculty and students, then we lose those opportunities for the emotional or academic support to take place. I'd also really, you know, like to see faculty who are teaching in LPN to RN programs show that they value LPN experience through something as simple as during class asking their students, what is your prior experience with this topic? And that goes beyond just our LPN to RN students, that if, if we're teaching a group that has students with a wide variety of backgrounds, it really helps them feel validated and, and build on their prior experience. As far as entering midway, what we specifically asked about was sharing classes with non-LPNs. So we don't know for sure that these, these LPNs uh, who are sharing classes with non-LPNs entered midway, but we can we can guess that most of them probably did based on how right. how programs tend to be designed for LPN seeking RN education. So when LPN to RN students shared classes with other students who weren't LPNs, they were less likely to report that faculty members recognized their past LPN experience. Mm. They were less likely to report emotional support from their faculty. And they were more likely to report finding it difficult to fit in with classmates. Some of these make sense, right? Of course, it's difficult to fit in with a cohort if that cohort has already been moving along through a curriculum and then LPN to RN students join that cohort. Um, I don't have national level data on how often that happens, but having looked at the curriculum for many, many of these programs nationally, it seems pretty common. Oftentimes there are students who start a pre-licensure program without the LPN, and then they are joined at some point by the LPNs. And, and this was reported previously in the literature as being a difficult, a difficult uh, place for students to mesh. So, so what can we do tomorrow to fix that? As educators, we need to acknowledge that this, this difficulty exists, um, you know, to our students, you know, welcome our LPNs when they're joining an already established cohort and provide opportunities for students to get to know each other, even though it may not be the entry point to the program for all students. Ad additionally, I think, you know, there's, any sort of cohesiveness or team building intervention that can be implemented is, is a wonderful idea. You know, there certainly could be more robust evidence-based programs out there, but something as easy as um, finding commonalities between all students in a class. Uh, one thing I do at the beginning of my classes is when I have a new cohort coming together, I have them do a word cloud about why they're here. Why do you want to be an RN? And those those common themes come up bigger and, and remind students that their reasons may be very similar to their peers. So, you know, certainly there can be simple interventions that can happen tomorrow. Overall, you know, we'd like to see 
interventions be evidence-based, um, but because there isn't a broad evidence base specific to LPN to RN students, evaluation of any kind of programs or interventions becomes all the more important. Yeah, I remember, you know, I graduated over 20 years ago from an ADM program, and we had a transition path, pathway for LPNs uh, where they came into, I believe, our third quarter of a seven-quarter program. And, you know, we really didn't engage with that group of maybe six or seven pretty much at all, even in the clinical setting. And they kind of separated themselves into a small clique, uh, which is understandable from what what we learned. Um, but yeah, I think about the lost opportunity there, not only for them, but for us as, as students um, to kind of share that experience that they've had and their prior knowledge. It wasn't really acknowledged or brought into the program. I remember some of our instructors would say like they need to reprogram them or erase their LPN background and they would say that kind of out loud. And so, you know, I, you can see where some of the, the difficulties lie. Absolutely. And, you know, in prior literature, some of the interactions between LPNs and non-LPNs in this situation have been reported as, you know, just flat out uncivil or, yeah. you know, really like a lateral violence kind of situation, you know. Um, and so I think we have room for improvement there. And, and having this national level data to say that this is, this is a potential problem for our LPN to RN students is that first step. Well, as we know, you know, there's a, a shortage of our ends, and we certainly don't want to discourage people from moving in that direction. But I'm not aware, though, is there also a shortage of LPNs? I, I, I... That's a great question, and I haven't looked at the data on that, but, uh, you know, I think that there there must be, you know, I think yeah. if if RNs are leaving the profession post-COVID or post-acute phase of the pandemic in the way um, that they are, I, I can't imagine that LPNs would be immune to that. So, okay, yeah. yeah, especially in a long-term care setting where um, a lot of them are employed and the stressors in the last few years, uh, specifically in that setting too. Hmm. What were your, were your findings different for LPN to RN versus uh, LPN to BSN or were, did you see any, find any LPN to BSN transition pathways? Great question. So about 20% of the students who we had responses from were in baccalaureate programs. So, you know, there certainly are programs nationally. They're not as common in the baccalaureate level as in the ADN, but they exist and their students responded to our survey too. So we didn't find many differences. Um, the two areas where there were difference were that um, for LPN to RN students in a baccalaureate degree program, they were more likely to say the distance they had to travel to school made it hard to do well in school. If you just look at, you know, how common those programs are geographically compared to an ADN program, it makes sense. It's, it's more likely that a student may need to travel to reach a baccalaureate program as opposed to an ADN program. So that makes a lot of intuitive sense um, as well. And LPN to RN students in a baccalaureate degree program were also less likely to say they felt support from their classmates. So that wasn't something I was really expecting, but some of the reasons I thought might be behind that are because, uh, you know, baccalaureate programs tend to be in larger institutions, oftentimes compared to an ADN program. Um, so it's a little harder to stick with the same cohort. It's more likely that students are interacting with a wider variety of students during their time at school, as opposed to the same core group. And so I think that in, in and of itself can lead to a lack of support from classmates. But I think right. that one was a little interesting and might bear further, further digging. And, you know, a transition, talking about transition isn't complete without talking about transition in the clinical space too. So how did they, the nurses actually treat the LPNs versus the non-LPNs in that transition pathway? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that that's something that, you know, would be a fantastic follow up study right. to really see. And, you know, and when we're talking about students who are still in school in clinical, oftentimes the nurses don't know if they're an LPN versus not, especially if you have a program where the two mix. Um, and 
And so it's interesting there, but certainly after graduation and when a, a graduate is on orientation, that's more likely, I think, to be recognized that, hey, they're an LPN. Um, I remember in my new graduate program, there was a student who was an LPN and had worked as an LPN, but had gone through an RN program. And she really advocated her, for herself to say, I need to be in this new grad program. I'm still a new grad RN. Right, and right. she met some pushback against that. But ultimately, you know, the facility did recognize that it is a different role and and supported her in in going into that program again going back to my personal experience uh, i do remember the lpns that were in our clinical rotation many times the the nurse that was working with them gave them a, a pretty wide platform to perform their duties and mm -hmm. also i the instructors you know intentionally or unintentionally spent less time with them um mm -hmm. I'm assuming under the assumption they know how to do many of the task oriented things, you know, not necessarily in the RN, RN mindset, but that um, when they got busy, the LPNs seemed to be the first that kind of were like left to the side as the instructor spent time with um, the students who didn't have the previous background. Yeah. And anecdotally, having done those sorts of clinical rotations with both types of students, you know, I find that certainly needs may be different between my LPNs and non-LPNs, but everyone has a lot of needs, right? And you mentioned right. one of the things that the mind space and, and the the critical thinking aspect that that is a, oftentimes a big transition for our LPNs coming back to become RNs. So what's the main takeaway you would want the readers to uh, go away with after reading this article? You had one main takeaway. I think the biggest takeaway is just to, to be intentional in how we integrate LPN to RN students into existing cohorts. And that particularly rings true to me because of the, the national level data that says that this is hard for our LPN to RN students to integrate um, with non-LPNs, but also because having read wider literature and having taught this population, I see those difficulties and how hard they can be. And so I think that's a good starting point. I think there's lots of Lots of great jumping off points from this study, but that in particular, you know, if we have a student who's feeling excluded or marginalized in their education, they're not prepared to flourish academically, socially, or professionally. Any further comments you have? I don't think so. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be on the podcast and to, to share this work. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I really appreciate your time and expertise in sharing your work and broadening our understanding of this work and how we can begin to introduce this into our own institutions and really be mindful of this phenomenon, I guess, right? This transition, the different needs of the transition from LPN to RN versus, you know, a student who doesn't have any previous healthcare experience going into the RN or BSN program. So to our listeners, if you've not had the opportunity to read about this work, um, please make sure you read the article Facilitators and Inhibitors of LPN to RN Student Transition, a cross-sectional national survey. And I want to thank uh, the listeners and especially you, Dr. Corning, for joining us today and sharing your expertise in this area. We really appreciate it. Thank you.